This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Tracker, a coin sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter the promo code KNOWHOW to save 20% off any order. Today on Know How, your questions are answers. It's a Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next however many minutes it takes, we're going to be opening up the cabinet of knowledge that you keep in your head and stocking it like groceries. Because we've gone to the knowledge store. Supermarket, really. Where we canned the knowledge. And I've got coupons. And then, <laughs> you got a lot of coupons. And Actually, a knowledge on aisle six. <laughs> knowledge is on discount. You're getting... <laughs> You're getting two for one today. You know, there will be a time when we have stretched that analogy far too far. I'm always curious to today see where where the knowledge is going to go. What what kind of container are we putting the knowledge in? We've milk done jugs. Ziploc bags. It's got to be milk jugs. I mean, milk jugs next? But, but not like the resealable ones, the ones no. with the plastic that you can kind of reseal, but not really, like if you ever touch right, them. Right, they're a pain in the butt. Yeah, yeah. Those. yeah no, I imagine that if we put them in like the paper milk cartons, on the side it would say missing, you know? It would, missing it would Picture knowledge. of knowledge, yeah. <laughs> mm. So there you have it, folks. We here at Know How, we kidnap knowledge, and it ends up on a milk carton. We Don't just, cry over spilt knowledge. We should just end, end the show right there. <laughs> no, but we've, we've got a great show for you. We're going to be putting together some of the questions that you've had, some of the project suggestions you had in the Google+. Plus. And, of course, I've got a review. If you like super fast, and I'm saying seriously, super, super fast network-attached storage, you're going to want to stay tapped because How I've got fast? a little something something. How oh, fast? I, oh, I don't know. Maybe super, super fast? something that has an interface that can go 10 times faster than anything you've, you've had. <laughs> Precisely, right. I'm imagining Sonic the Hedgehog right now. Go, gotta, gotta go, go fast. fast. Gotta go fast. Gotta go. But we're going to start first with, actually, this is a fantastic project idea. It, I kind of repurposed the electronics from a project I already had, mm -hmm. but we had uh, a, a fan of the show who had a very particular suggestion for something we should build. Brian, what is it? All right, so Mark went into the community and asked us, I am currently a resident in a nursing home and have difficulty with what they have as a call light. When you press the button by your bed, a small LED light comes on above the bed. The problem is I am visually impaired and cannot see if the small LED is on. After waiting a while, I am always having to press the button not knowing whether the light is on or not. I would like some kind of light sensor that could be placed over the small LED and have it buzz or give some kind of audible sound so I know if the button has been pressed. I do have my desktop computer in a, a few feet away and thought about having some kind of USB device that could have my computer produce a sound. I am enclosing a picture of the wall plate where the LED is located. I have had dreams of since it was hooked up to my computer, I would be able to log log of how long light was on each time uh, it's on. Okay. All right. Thank you in advance, he says. Right. Okay, we'll so see take if we a, can figure this out. Take a look at this this picture. So this this is the plate that he has uh, right now in, in his, uh, his room. So the whole idea is, that you see where there's like a plug? That's connected to a button. So when he pushes that button, it lights up and it calls the nursing station. This uh -huh. is actually, this is a common feature. We also have it in our retirement home in Los, uh, Los Gatos, which is mm -hmm. where I will eventually end up. I mean, I already know where I'm going to die, Ryan. It's going to be in there. It's <laughs> not so, too far off. Yeah. Not too far off. But, but the, the thing is, mm -hmm. he's got some issues with vision. Uh, so he's not sure if the light's actually on. Mm. Yeah. So actually, Alex, if you could go back to that picture, what, what I'm thinking is to use the project that I had already started creating to uh, text people when the done light turned on on the washer. Right. So the idea is to put a sensor right over that light, and then it would trigger an Arduino. And that Arduino would then be able to either sound a buzzer Mm -hmm. or say activate a shaker, like the, you've got in a cell phone, the little yeah. vibration thing. Mm -hmm. Something that gives you a, a non-visual cue that an action has taken place. In this right. particular case, he wants to know when the light is, is activated. Mm -hmm. He also said, this is that last part where the English wasn't... We, the, I stumbled a little. You stumbled a bit. <laughs> but, but what he wants is he wants to keep a log 
of how long he's waited every time. Because every time a nurse responds, they hit that little cancel button, the light turns off. So right. all of this should be automated. So he wants to keep track of the response time? He wants to keep a track yeah. of the response time. And, you know, I, I could just tell you about what you have to build, or I could kind of show you. Uh, what? I had a little free time, so I, I mocked up the electronics. Uh, and Alex, if you go to the side view here, this, this is a, a demonstration of exactly that. Uh, we've got a couple of components here that you are familiar with. This is an RTC. And this is because a real-time clock mm -hmm. because we're going to want to keep track of the time, right? right? And uh, the Arduino is not really good on doing it on its own. No. This is an Arduino, and this could be any Arduino. I'm using an Uno, but in the final mock-up, I'm going to use a, a Nano mm -hmm. because I want it to be nice and small because I want to create a 3D enclosure that will screw onto the plate. Right, right. The Uno is great for doing the prototyping, and then once you've figured out your wiring, you Precisely. shrink down to the Precisely. Nano. This is the uh, LCD screen, the 2004A. Uh, SDA and SCL, so this is the I squared C connected device. Uh, this will allow me to display the information he wants. So he wants to know when it's been activated and he wants to know a log. So mm -hmm. how long is it, has it taken them to respond in the past? Right. There's one piece that's missing that we have not yet used on know-how, and that's this thing right here. What is it? So this is the light sensor. So this is called a light intensity sensor. This module, actually, it, right there, this, this thing I'm touching, that is a photoresistor. Huh. So the, the whole idea is when there is no light, there is no current through this. When there is light, it starts to have more and more current. But the cool thing about this module, because I could just take a photoresistor and figure out a way to wire it in, mm -hmm. this module actually allows me to adjust with this little potentiometer yeah how much light will trigger the device ah oh, that's cool it's a light button it's a light button right nice. so if it detects light it will allow current through if mm -hmm. not then it stops right that's really neat right and so this actually has a digital it has both analog and digital output but i'm using the digital output super simple circuit this connects into the arduino and to pin number what is it pin number three mm -hmm. and when it triggers pin three so it'll either be low or high right and when it triggers that's when the Arduino knows that the, the button has been pushed, the light is on. Now, when once that has happened... It should start a timer. It starts a timer, and it could start a buzzer. I didn't put a buzzer on this yeah. because it's an annoying thing, but uh, <laughs> the other thing I was thinking about doing for him, because I, I promised him I would build this for him, uh, instead of a buzzer, I'm, I, there's a little Arduino MP3 player. So I was thinking, well, put like elevator music. You push the button and it just... <laughs> do, 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 yeah, right? Do, yeah. Hey, that's, That'd be awesome. But let's go ahead and show you how this looks, because I actually did a little bit of the coding. Let's plug this bad mamma jamma in. Okay, so we've got this powered up, and Alex, actually, if you go to the side view here, so the screen has been uh, turned on. I'm going to use this to simulate the light that he would see from mm -hmm. the call button, right? So it's got to be bright enough, but as soon as it gets lit up, that's it's cool. going to start doing a wait time. So it's going to keep a running count of how long it takes for someone to push the cancel button. When they right. push the cancel button, the light will go off. And now here's the cool thing. What it will do is it, it will store the different wait times. So the right. last three wait times, it will just keep on the screen. Nice. And the next time you trigger, it will start up the timer again. And when you stop it, it moves it down. That's cool. Super simple programming. I like that. Super simple circuit. But, you know, there's, this is what I like about Arduino, is there's a lot of utility in this. Now, if you wanted to output that into, like, a text document or something like that, a way of keeping track of it, because we know that you can save variables to the EEPROM on, right. the, on the Android, or not Android, Arduino, but if you wanted to, like, put um, a shield on it so that you could output it to, like, a computer or, like... A yeah, uh, so you could, you could just keep it connected via USB because this can communicate with the computer, mm. and you could use... Uh, a, a framework on the computer to interface. I think the much better way to do it, much easier way and the standalone way to do it is to take like a network shield, something yeah. like either the, the little ethernet shield that we've been playing with or a Wi-Fi shield, Yeah. and then have it use a, surface li a service like Cayenne, which is free, mm -hmm. so that every time it triggers, it actually changes a status on an internet server, which you can then log on your computer. Yeah, okay. That's probably the way I would do it, rather than connecting it directly to the computer, because then there's issues if the cable gets oh, detached totally, yeah. or if the computer crashes, you lose the log. Yeah. This is standalone, but it, it will work. And remember, 
it's a trivial matter to, along with starting the timer, say, go ahead and start uh, the vibration motor or start a buzzer or start or the Or start playing motor. the girl from Ipanema. Yep. Yeah. So that's, this, is, this is what we're going to do for him. So I'm going to be building this. Again, this is just a mock-up. Mm -hmm. The problem I've been having, Alex, if you go back to, uh, to that, uh, the, the Google Plus thing, he's got an image there. If, if you look at Tiny. it... I kind of want to make it fit exactly over this Tectone plate. So you're going to have to get that, a hold of that. Uh, yeah, and it's not easy. The, they don't give those out. Because I need that sensor to go right over that light. In fact, there's going to be, I'm going to make it like a little 3D housing mm -hmm. that's going to make sure that no extraneous light gets in there. Right. Uh, because you, you actually want the sensitivity to be at the point where it's not going to be falsely triggered. Yeah. Well, is the sensor on this little shield, is it this red thing? It's right a little here? round thing, yeah. So well, that's the photoresistor. What if you were able to, could you disconnect that and have wires that connect back to the board and basically, absolutely, absolutely. just like a little, little, yeah, extension yeah. for it and then use a sticker yep. to hold and, it and, But the thing is, then it's kind of janky. It what, is janky. What will happen yeah. is if it ever falls off or if it like, if it separates enough to develop a light leak, yeah. then it just triggers even though the light's not on. Yeah, good point. That's, yeah, I don't want that. That's, That's really cool, though. And I could see using other sensors to keep track of things, because I know my dad back in the day would have loved something like this, where how long was the front door open? Yeah. You know, like. well, or, I mean, this, what I originally designed the circuit for is for the, the washer-dryer. Yeah. Um, we, I live in a community of guys, and sometimes people will leave their wash in the washer or dryer for days. Days? And then they'll say, no, no, I took it right out. It's like, well, no, I've got a log here. Got it was log. in there for three days. And I've also got my nose. Got my, it yeah. smells like mildew now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's my, um, <laughs> we, <laughs> I live with a guy who, I guess he's learned this over the years, but you know how you should iron your shirts after they come out of the, the, the dryer? Yeah, yeah. Or you can get them fresh out, and if you hang up right away, there's still then, enough residual heat, right? Yeah, then the wrinkles will go So away. if he misses his, his chance, he'll, he'll just go back into the washer and do it again. <laughs> oh, that's bad. That's not good. That's I, good. There's another trick, though. If you hang them up while you're in the shower, Sh yes, yeah, that that's the other works. one I've tried to. But let's go ahead and take a look at some of the code. Now, this is all incredibly preliminary. This is not the code for the finished project. Mm -hmm. It's just a project that I've been working on, and I kind of applied what we're trying to do here. Okay. So, Alex, if you go to my computer, uh, there's a couple of things we've done. First, we're including wire, which is the I squared C device. Uh, Liquid Crystal I squared C, that's the library that allows it to address the screen. Uh, oh, I probably don't need to include files. <laughs> that's weird. Uh, again, this is what happens when you mash together code. This is the one, this is the line that allows me to access the real-time clock. All of this is totally normal. We've done this before. This is from the, uh, the, the previous Arduino projects that we've done with RTC. Right. right. This right here, this analog sensor pin and digital sensor pin, those are the ways that I can talk to the digital sensor, mm -hmm. uh, to, to the light sensor. And again, it does two different outputs. One is a digital output, and one is an analog output. Hmm. You could use the analog output if you wanted multiple levels, like how much light are you, are you using? Yeah. In this case, I don't care about that. I just want to know, is it on or is it off? Okay. So I'm using the digital. A bunch of stuff here. This, all this, you may remember this from when we were playing with our clock, when we made the clock in Arduino 102. These are the variables that I use so that it doesn't rewrite the screen unless the number has changed. And that just keeps the flicker down. Right. These are new. Uh, the little log that I created. Oh, That's it. Yeah. So what it will do is it stores three sets, seconds and minutes. So second one, second two, two second three, three, minute one, minute two, minute three. That's where it keeps the previous wait times. Right. Okay. And hours would be... I, that would be scary I mean, if it was taking that long. I could yeah. put that, that's, it's no. the same code. I could put that in there, yeah, but if you're waiting hours, uh, you're in the wrong out. nursing facility. Definitely. That's, <laughs> that's bad, that's bad. <laughs> All right, so the setup is I, I tell it which pin am I connected to. Mm -hmm. um, then I activate the LCD and turn on the backlight. Um, I'm also, this allows me to output to my serial in case I want to debug or if you wanted to get the data from uh, into your computer, this this works. This is how you would do it. Uh, I see. Right? All right. The rest of this, this is mostly all the the code that we've seen before for a real time clock. You need this in order to be able to access it to read, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get interesting again until we get to here. So this is the timer function. If we look at the loop first, all the loop does is a light check. That's what we want. We want yeah. minimal code in our in our main loop. It's going to run the light check. And what light check does is it just says, hey, 
is there anything on the pin connected to the light intensity sensor? And if not, don't do anything, and if so... Right. If nothing is there, then, see, because that's what the SIF statement is, if that switch state is low. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if there is light, then do this. If not, you, here's the end of the if, do nothing. Mm -hmm. So if there is no light, all this Arduino is going to do is keep calling light check, light check, light check, light check, light check. Right. It won't do anything until light check says, oh, hey, yeah, the, the state changed. Right, the light is on now. The light is now on. So if the state changes, which is what this is, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to set the timer to zero. Remember this? This is how we set time yeah. on a clock, right? Mm -hmm. In this particular case, I'm not using it as a clock. I'm using it as a timer. So right. every time I want to start, I just say zero seconds, zero minutes, zero hours, zero days, zero day of week, mm -hmm. zero years. So I'm essentially, I'm not using the clock as it was intended. I'm using it as no. a timer instead of as a clock. Right. But you're, you're setting the baseline. Basically. Right. They're setting the, the, the bottom. <laughs> bottom. It's, it's zero. Now, while the switch state is equal low, so while the light continues to be on, it will only do what's between these two brackets. So the first one says, hey, if the switch is on, if the light is on, mm -hmm. set the timer to zero, set the RTC to zero, then jump into this while statement. As long as the light stays on, all it will do is it will first check to see if the light is still on, because you have to do that, otherwise you get stuck there, otherwise the, the state never changes, right? right? Right. And then it runs timer, and here's what the timer does. Timer will read the time from the RTC, and remember, I set it to zero. Mm -hmm. Then, just like we did with the clock, it's just gonna print it. So this is, the, this is actually the same code from our LCD clock in Arduino 102. It, it's gonna print it, and because I'm starting at zero, it looks like a timer. It's gonna start from zero every single time. Right, which makes sense. Right, and it will continue to do that. So it will stay in timer until there's no light. And the light turns when on. there's no light, what's going to happen is it's going to pass by this, uh, this while statement, and now it first clears the LCD, so it gets everything off of there. Then it's going to call the time. It's going to, in other words, where did you leave the function? Mm -hmm. It's going to store that inside of here, second. Mm -hmm. But first, before I do that, the third value is filled up with the second value. Mm -hmm. The second value is filled up with the first value, and then the first value is filled up with the new value. And that's my log. I see, okay. Right, and then this, this part, all this does is it prints the log on the screen. Right, and then, and then for the following timer that gets set, because you're having it go previous time, previous time. Right. Okay, okay. so, okay. so, yeah, it, so keeps, it falls, it's like a... But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it it's, it's, uh, cascades. Yeah. So this will only be called if the light is on at some point. Because right. this exists inside of this if statement. So it's only if, only if the light goes on am I gonna shuffle my values. Right. Uh, so if you go back to the side view here, Alex, you can see how this works. So immediately it starts timing, Timer's take away the light, on. it changes the value down. So timing. And then pass the value yep. on. Timing. Yeah. Let's go up to four seconds. Ooh, change it up. Risque. There you go. <laughs> now, if, cool. if you had if you had response time like this, then you're in a great nursing home. And also, so you were saying that you can set the tolerance for the amount of light that right. it sets it off with the little screw there. Precisely. So if you take a look at this, this this little potentiometer, this allows me to set off when it's so enough this is light. So the right now, light the studio setting. lighting is enough to set off the timer, and not, I'd have to actually, actually cover it to make it stop. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, Alex is getting oh, tricky there. Alex didn't oh, I can bring it down, Alex. Oh, come on. What you got? What you got? Oh, oh. Oh, oh that's what you got. No light. You know what? Actually, no. Bring it down. Let's see. Let's see if I can... Uh, if. How, yeah, what's the ambient? Oh. oh, the camera is now struggling. Oh, but it's it's working. The timer is actually on. Oh, Camera, hello. The camera doesn't like low, hello, low light. Hello, camera. There we go. Okay, this is never turning off now because basically I said total black is still on. <laughs> Even when you cover it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not so that useful. That is completely useless. That's, that's yeah. kind of useless. Yeah, that's cool though that yeah. you can dial it in that way. So uh, yeah, and what I what I need to do is I need to make this potentiometer uh, accessible because he needs to be able to dial it in himself. Right. So, Good point. Uh, yeah, exactly. So once he gets it installed, 
And again, I wanted a 3D frame that will firmly install it right against that light. Yeah. He needs to be able to access that potentiometer so that he can adjust it so it, it only comes on when the light is on. You could even, I guess, incorporate like a little dial, you know, like where there's a yeah. 3D printed enclosure and then you have one of those potentiometer dials, so like kind of... To, I can make yeah. this steampunk. <gasps> yeah, exactly, yeah. I could put gears. Yeah! <laughs> and LED lights. Uh, now you're getting artistic okay, with the idea. Yeah. But, 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 but yeah, this is something that, uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to build this for him until I get back from Tertianship. So that's in August. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but Mark, uh, I, you've seen it. I have built this thing, and as soon as it is done, I will send it to you, yeah. uh, and everyone else will get the code. Because uh, someone else in that, that, uh, that thread mm -hmm. was like, wait, if you're going to build this, can, you, can the rest of us see it? Because this is kind of cool. And then, yes, it is. Because any, anything that has a light yeah. that you want to activate something else, this is how you would do it. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, you hmm. don't have to do what I did. Uh, the first version of the washer dryer thing. Yeah. I actually opened up the control panel and wired in <laughs> to the LED. Yeah. Uh, I mean that works, but yeah. it's better if you don't have to touch that because if you burn out those, those electronics, there's going to be a lot of really upset people with you. Yeah, definitely. And uh, <laughs> as I was mentioning earlier, I was talking about like where my dad would he would be upset if we left the front door open. You know, the old, the age old. Right. Like, are you trying to heat the neighborhood? Yes, I am, Dan. Uh, <laughs> and keep track of how long we left the front door open. But uh, <laughs> Alex made a good point that uh, he'd probably want to keep track of how long I was playing video games instead. If, you the, really if there was know a that? if there was a way, yeah, he wouldn't want to know I that. Know if you want to know that, Brian, put the light sensor on like the front of the Xbox or something, <laughs> so you know how long you've been playing on the Xbox. So he knows when to pick up the phone and disrupt the uh, the dial up between us playing Doom. That's how. Mom, old, that's I'm how on old the school. internet. Mom! <laughs> <laughs> See, there's a whole generation that doesn't understand what that is, but you do. No, you we do. do. We're the yeah. kind of the last, the the last of generation, that generation. Folks. I had a practical peripherals 14.4. That was the fastest thing ever. Uh huh. So, I, I, I had a dial up modem. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember how fast it was, though. It was, it was sad. So we had external, because we still had, like, serial and parallel ports on our computers. So I had a nice little, it was a white practical peripherals box. Yeah. That thing was, when I bought it, that was, like, 600 bucks, And this was, like, a $1990. So that was a lot of money. Didn't you have one, though, too? It was, like, a phone that you, Acoustic like... Acoustic coupler, yeah. <laughs> 300 baht. <laughs> don't, don't be... Whoa. Hey, hey, the thing about yeah. that, you could use it on pay phones. Oh, okay. That is, yeah. So you, I used to be able to put the payphone on it, and then I would generate the 2600 hertz tone mm -hmm. that and would it, tell it was a service call, and then I could call anywhere I wanted. You, get <laughs> you don't have to touch the buttons. You just get your computer to send the tones through right. the phone. And that's how you, the first time you talked to the Pope was using Actually, that. Actually, <laughs> this was allegedly. This was all allegedly. <laughs> yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. When we come back, we've got a special treat for you. We're going to be taking a look at that fantastic Synology NAS, the ah, network attached storage so box pretty. with the 10 gig ethernet interface. Yes. You already know that I love Synology. I love the fact that it's durable. I love the fact that it's dependable, it's consistent, it's powerful, and it's got so much flexibility. You can run yeah. so many apps on it. You can, you can just load the thing up to do pretty much everything you want it to do. But what happens when a geek gets access to really, really, crazy fast transfers. We're going to show you in just a bit, but first, let's take a moment for these messages. Now, folks, we know that you love your gadgets. I mean, you wouldn't be fans of the Twit TV network if you didn't. But what happens when you lose those gadgets? What happens when you lose your prized possessions? What happens when you do something as silly as walking away from it at a coffee shop or at the park? Well, folks, if it was the old world, then you'd just have to kiss that investment goodbye. You'd have to say goodbye to your treasured technology, but we don't have to do that anymore because we've got the Tracker. The Tracker is a coin-sized device that you can attach to anything that you might lose, which will give you its position down to the meter pretty much any time you want. Now, eight years ago, Tracker changed everything when they released their first tracking device, and now they've done it again with the all-new Tracker Pixel. With the Tracker Pixel, you never need to worry about losing your things again. It's the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. You place Tracker Pixel on whatever you tend to lose. Again, your keys, your wallets, even your cat. And it's small enough to fit on your smallest items. Now, when you misplace that item, not, not if, but when you misplace it, and it has a Tracker Pixel attached, you can use your smartphone and a 90 decibel alert will help you find it in seconds. Even, it even has a powerful LED light so you can find your items in the dark. Now, if you lose your phone, it also works in reverse. You can press the button on your Tracker Pixel 
and your phone rings even if it's on silent. You can even locate your items if it's miles away because tracker users are part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. That means as long as you're near another tracker user, you can still get a notification on your phone about where your device is located. And Tracker's 30-day money-back guarantee means that you truly have nothing to lose. If you're like me, if you check the obvious places every time you lose your device, the couch, the kitchen pockets, then weird places like the bathroom, the fridge, the hamper, then you start getting creative and looking in things like the peanut butter jar, then you're going to want the Tracker because it will keep you from having all that anxiety. Tracker keeps your most treasured tech where it should be, with you. Just go to thetracker.com and enter the promo code KNOWHOW to save 20% off any order. That's the tracker, T H E T R A C K R dot com, promo code KNOWHOW for 20% off. And we thank the tracker for their support of KNOWHOW. Okay, so Brian. Yes. A while back, I showed uh, a, a new box that had arrived at my lab. It was an <laughs> unboxing, didn't know what it was. Yeah. Uh, wasn't really expecting anything, but it was Synology sending me one of their newest NASAs, their mm -hmm. most highly performing NASAs, but with a twist a 10 gig ethernet card. Uh, yeah, I don't think I've seen you quite as giddy. You, it seemed like was, you're yeah, opening a, a present was, on Christmas. There was some giddiness, there was yeah. some giddiness. I mean, because, I, look, I've, I've got a 10 gig network at home, but mm -hmm. I don't have 10 gig devices. Right. Uh, and of all the devices in my network, the one that could use it the most- Is your NAS. Is the NAS, because that's where all the files are. That's where I'm gonna be having the, the heavy transfers. I mean, yeah, a 10 gig router, that's probably not gonna do you so much good. No. A 10 gig camera, well, I hope it's not using 10 gig, but, the central point of storage for all the devices on my network, yeah, I think that's uh, that's worth it. Yeah, and it came, it's a nice looking box, and then also, um, it, I think the part that I've always been impressed with since moving on to the Synology router was the mm. software package. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that has really changed, because I, I used to be a QNAP guy. Uh, I was big in the QNAP, I was also big in the ReadyNAS. Those are solid products, I mean, they, they do things very, very well, they're, they're well built. But the thing about Synology, it's that ecosystem of plugins. The plugins are fantastic. Everything from from Plex to you know things like a DNS or VPN servers, yeah. you you can really get in there. And I mean, my network wouldn't work without the 15, the 15, 13 that I have in my network because right. that runs containers. So when I run a browser, it's running in a container off that NAS. And you're going to need speed for that. It's got to so. go fast, Brian. So now that you've had time to play with it, what did you think? Well, I could talk about it. Or I could just show you. Synology has impressed me year after year with network attached storage boxes that define the SMB industry with an almost impossible combination of speed, reliability, richness of features, and affordability. They even managed to bring their NAS expertise to the incredibly crowded router market and instantly became one of the top providers of premium home networking equipment. So, when we received the Synology DS1517 Plus, expectations were high. This $700 and up box looks a lot like the exceptional 1515 Plus it replaces, but the question was, would it deliver more? The answer, yes, but also, it depends. They both have five drive bays. They both have four gigabit ethernet ports with link aggregation that allows them to be bonded, assuming you have a capable switch for higher bandwidth. They both have four USB 3.0 ports and two eSATA ports that can be used either for single drive expansion or for connecting up to 10 drives into expansion chassis. They both are powered by quad-core 64-bit Intel Atom C2538 processors running at 2.4 gigahertz, and they both run the same DSM operating system. After a peek inside, however, it becomes clear that the 1517 Plus is the evolved form of the 1515 Plus. Both have upgradable memory, but while the 1515 Plus tops out at 6GB, the 1517 Plus can be expanded to 16GB of dual-channel memory. Both units have the ability to use an SSD as a cache to speed transfers, but while the 1515 Plus needs to use up one of its drive bays to take advantage of that feature, the 1517 Plus can use a dual M.2 SSD adapter to give you even more performance than a SATA SSD while allowing you to continue using your fifth drive bay for more storage. Most importantly for network geeks like myself who are chomping at the bit for just a little extra something, the DS1517 Plus has an open Gen 2 x 8 PCIe slot that can be populated with a 10 gig Ethernet adapter. 
In the case of our review unit, Synology has equipped the box with a dual SFP Plus card, perfect for top of rack operation. But if you want to use one of the less expensive 10 gig RJ45 options, the 1517 Plus also supports third-party cards that can sell for under $200. I used an SFP Plus cable and an SFP Plus desktop card to link up, mirroring what will probably be the norm for at least a while in the SMB space. 10 gig switches still tend to be a bit too expensive. Okay, so how fast is fast? Well, you're not gonna get 10 gigabit per second speed, but the results were still very impressive. With my default setup with three drives, I clocked a read performance of 450 megabytes per second read and a write speed of 310 megabytes per second write. That's 3,600 megabits per second read and 2,480 megabits per second write versus the 800 megabits per second read and 500 megabits per second write that I expect from one gig ethernet. However, using an all SSD setup and maxing out the memory brought performance to a stratospheric 1,112 megabytes per second read and 462 megabytes per second write, or almost 9,000 megabits per second read and 3,700 megabits per second write. In other words, damn. Now I know that some of our audience need the alphabet spec soup, so here we go. The DS1517 Plus supports 2.5 inch hard drives and SSDs, as well as 3.5 inch drives up to 10 terabytes for a max of 50 terabytes in chassis storage. Everything is powered by an internal 200 watt power supply. It has four RJ45 gigabit ethernet ports, four USB 3.0 ports, three in the back, one in the front, and two eSATA ports. It can be configured for link aggregation or port failover. It can read FAT, XFAT, HFS, NTFS, EXT3 and 4, and BTRFS file systems, configured into JBOD RAID 0 through 10, as well as Synology's hybrid RAID. It can act as an iSCSI target for up to 32 devices and supports 256 iSCSI LUNs. Maximum volume size using the expansion chassis is 108 terabytes. It measures 166 millimeters by 250 millimeters by 243 millimeters and weighs about four and a half kilos. Now that may cover raw hardware, but let's get into the software. Our review 1517 Plus is running DSM 6.1. As much as I like the hardware, it's Synology's operating system that really makes their NAS as special because it's so flexible. Want to run your network storage services entirely off the 1517 Plus? You can do that with support for up to 2,048 local users, 256 local groups, and 512 shared folders. Or you can integrate it with your 802x ACL NFS authentication. Want to segment your network? You can individually assign each of the four Ethernet ports or use VLANs. Want to secure your network? Run your own email server with up to 90 clients and 20 VPN connections. That's the beauty of Synology's approach. Use it the way you want, with just the features you need. Speaking of need, I need to talk about the Synology plugin ecosystem because that is special in its field. DSM has the ability to expand the feature set with plugins that can run entirely in the OS as well as using specialized hardware in the DS1517+. Want a security camera network? Grab a few IP cameras and install Surveillance Station. You get two licenses out of the box and can constantly monitor, record, and notify for 10 cameras at about $50 per additional camera. Are you a cord cutter who wants to create an over-the-air network DVR? Get an inexpensive USB digital receiver and install any of a number of plugins to automatically record and stream your favorite OTA programming. Have a dead spot in your Wi-Fi coverage? Plug in a USB Wi-Fi adapter and turn your NAS into a hotspot, or why not get a 4G USB dongle to provide failover internet connectivity to your network? Want to run your own cloud office suite? Well, that's completely free, and combined with the VPN capabilities, you now have the option of having Google Docs or Office 365-like cloud convenience with the peace of mind of knowing that your data stays on your network. Or perhaps you're a media junkie and you want all your movies, music, and photos to be available to you at all times for free. Again, grab a plugin that uses the hardware transcoding capability of Synology NASes, and you're good to go. From security apps to containers, DNS servers to media organizers, there's probably more than a few Synology plugins that will be exactly what you were looking for. And that's true if you're a networking newbie who just wants a way to see your photos on your phone, or a grizzled IT guy who is over everything. In short, the price is right, the performance is exceptional, and the feature set is flexible. In fact, the only reason why the purchase of a 1517 Plus is a depends is if you already have a 1515.
And we are back. Okay, so this is quite possibly the, the best NAS I currently have. Actually, not quite possibly. It is the best NAS I currently have in circulation. It is so flexible. It is so fast. And pretty much it does everything I want out of a NAS. I can probably yeah. retire two or three of the arrays and just replace it. With just it. use this? With That's this how highly camera. you regard this, Yeah, huh? this is really good. It's, it's a nice looking machine, too. I mean, and it's got everything you would need. This is what happens when you keep iterating on a product rather than trying to make a brand new product category. Mm -hmm. I mean, Synology, they already amazed me when they came out with a router that was actually really, really good. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a commodity. It was actually something that, that built on their experience with NAS boxes. This box, it's, you know, I would run this in an enterprise. Nice. With, with a 10 gig interface, this would absolutely be suitable to run things like VMs straight off of the uh, off the array. Right, and it's it's at a price that you know it's not out of the reach of the yeah. What is the price human. on it? Yeah, you know, it depends. Okay, so it's with drives or without drives. You're going to be looking between a thousand and two thousand. Uh, okay. Depending on how you want to equip this thing, and that's again, that's not bad. That's it's no, 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 for the kind of hardware that you get with it, that's not bad. But I think for for me or maybe even your average NAS user, it's not just that they threw a bunch of hardware into the box. It's that it's also paired with the the interface and the software that I'm now more familiar with using the router. But they kind of, they blend over, and when you, it makes it easy to do stuff with the hardware, that makes all the difference. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I got to say. The support that I've gotten from Synology has been, bar none, the best in the industry. Even better than QNAP, and QNAP is pretty good. <laughs> and, and what I've done in the past is I will not register this under my name, so they're not, they don't know it's me. Mm -hmm. And then I'll call with typical issues that a, a NAS user might have, and they can answer it every single time. Very it's, cool. It's, I, I got to tell you, it's, <laughs> if, if they could bring this down to like the price of the, the 1500s, this would be the no-brainer. Yeah. So if you were running uh, older NASs, is this one worth to uh, upgrade then? It, it really depends because an older NAS, even though you know, it's, it, it, let's say Synology, an older Synology NAS, yeah. probably has a lot of the capabilities of this. Unless you really need 10 gig speeds, you, pro you probably can't justify it with that interface card. I and see. if you take away that interface card, it, it dramatically drops the price of the array. Okay. But, I mean, if you have an older array or if you've got like one of those no-namers that <laughs> just kind of chugs along, yes, step up to this, you will be so happy. Even if you don't get the 1700 series, get something like the, the 200 series, the dual drive bay ones uh, that run you $300, uh, that give you the apps, the plugins that you get out of the Synology system, and uh, yeah, that's, that's gonna be for you. Very cool, I like it. So when do I get to play with it? <clears throat> oh, harsh, harsh, um, the silence says it all. No, <laughs> totally. Did. It's okay. You don't need to share. I know how much you like it. I do. <laughs> <laughs> but if you end up getting rid of your old ones, you know. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> well, folks, we, uh, we're not going to answer that question right now. Instead, we're going to be moving over to more of your questions, our answers. But before we get there, let's take a moment for these messages. Who's your daddy? <laughs> You're my daddy. Ben Horns, your daddy. Did you do any hot swapping? I guess you haven't really played with it too much, huh? Yeah. Oh, there's a Tim's hair on it. That's definitely. Well, the last time we had, we was here. We had Terps in the studio. That. Makes sense. Oh, <laughs> it's Turbos. like he's here with us right now. Oh, except he doesn't stink. Oh, he's so stinky right now. Otherwise, I would have brought him in with me. Alright, let's go back. And in three, two, and we are back. Now, uh, during the break, we actually did have someone in the chat room who wanted, was kind of shocked by the, the price point. Uh, mm. One to $2,000 is equipped with the full drives, like, you know, like 10 terabytes. Actually, it would be 15 terabytes of drives. Right. And the 10 gig card. Uh, you don't have to get that. The base Those model, are options. Yeah, yeah the, the super simple, empty 
chassis is something like seven hundred dollars. Okay, because yeah, the other number, would you say it was fifteen hundred, two thousand? Yeah, yeah, thousand, two thousand. It depends on how you want to configure it. it. I was like, right. that's like twice as much as what my PC cost me to build. Yeah, but but you got to remember, I mean, this is kind of stacked out. Oh, totally. Because you can increase the amount of memory, you can change the drives, yeah. you can, and that ten gig interface card. I mean, that's not super cheap. No, no. But if you do make that investment, it's probably going to last you for a long time. Like, how long do you typically hold on to an S4? Uh, I follow enterprise packages, mm. uh, enterprise practices. So I will only hang on to a product until end of life. So when they retire a product, it gets retired from my physical plant. Okay, and that can vary I yeah. mean, depending on the company. Yeah. And it's products. just I, I cannot have my data on a network switch or a NAS that is no longer supported. Because if it goes down, I need to be able to call someone to, to fix it. Good point. Yeah. Because I feel like if I had something like this, I would probably hang on to it for a long time because I don't think 10 gigabits going to last me a while. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've got a Synology NAS that's been in my network for seven years now. That's pretty good. It's still chugging away all the original parts. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's go ahead and move on to some more questions. We've got one here from Peter Hans, who saw a little something, something, I think probably on my appearance on uh, the new screensavers, <laughs> and uh, he wants it for his summer travels. So Peter asks this, I know on your recent travels you had mentioned a new mobile hotspot what you were trying. I have an upcoming trip and I want to look into the one that you used. Looked through the recent know-how show notes and did not see it mentioned. Yeah, hmm. Peter, there's a good reason for that because it was never on know-how, <laughs> it was on the new screensavers. That it was the one I did with uh, Aaron Newcomb. Okay. And uh, this is it. So this is, it's just a hotspot. We've all seen hotspots. But the difference is this is one of those seamless hotspots. It's sort of like an eSIM. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually pop off this color, cover and put in standard size SIMs. However, the real advantage of this is not the device, it's the service. It's called GlocalMe. And what they've what? done... Say that again? Glocal. GlocalMe. GlocalMe. G-L-O-C-A-L. -L so local, global, me. Glocal me. Yeah. Okay. It's All a right. thing. It's a branding thing. Glocal me. Silly name, but actually a really good device. Okay. So you can use this international. All you have to do is fill up the device. So you recharge the device, and then it will work in, well, it worked in all the countries I visited. So I was in Rome, the Netherlands, Malta. Uh, I was in Beijing. Okay. I went to the Philippines. And in all places, this was able to connect nice. in just a couple of, of seconds. Okay. Yeah. Now, let me, let me go ahead and show you what the interface looks like. Alex, if you go to my computer, this is the GlocalMe interface. This, they need to work on this. Uh, it's a good <laughs> device, but seriously, this website, is it's not intuitive. Uh, why is your icon a small child? Uh, because it's who I am inside. <laughs> You're a little white child, a <laughs> little white girl? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, kind of creepy, actually. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, you have the same dead eyes. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. So when I got this device, I charged it up with 50 euro worth of credit. Mm -hmm. And I used this extensively. This was my primary communications link because I did not buy a local SIM like I normally do. Uh -huh. Normally when I go into a country, I buy a SIM mm -hmm. and that's what I use. But the problem is I hopped to four different countries. And I didn't want to have to buy four different SIMs. Yeah. That would that would have been 80 euro, 20 bucks minimum. Pain in the butt, yeah. Right, so I got one, I paid 50 euro, and actually, Alex, Alex, if you go back to that, you'll notice I have 28.46 left. So mm -hmm. I really didn't use much. Uh, and if you look at the traffic history, it's, uh, let's see, it's go I, when did I start using this thing? Um, come on. Yeah, maybe the software does. Their so little, yeah, their, their website is not super, super but it awesome. worked so but yeah see so it tracks all the different places where hmm. it accessed let's see if i can go back see to how much Rome data you used so that that's all in the netherlands there's malta, malta. my homeland let's see if i can get well, rome's around here somewhere but yeah it just I, it roams from from country to country to country okay so you bought just one sim and what country was that no no sim no sim. No i sim. didn't have to buy a sim, didn't buy a sim. so oh, this okay. th this was the other cool part this was ready to go when I was in the States. I didn't have to buy anything locally. So when I landed in Rome, I turned this on. It figured out where it was. It adjusted itself. It went to my account and said, okay, yeah, you're oh, active. that is cool. So That is much less of a pain in the butt than trying to buy a SIM in each country. Precisely. Yeah. Literally 45 seconds after touching down, I turned this thing on, and now my phone and my computer had Wi-Fi access to the Internet. Oh, that's and it was smart. enough to make a, a voice call. I was like, oh, I didn't expect that. Very cool. And yeah, so when you connect to it with your phone, do you get a reading of like how strong the signal is, or can you? Uh, no, so there's little lights here, so it's it'll tell you right here how well you're connected yeah. to it's, this I mean, network. They, they 
probably could use a better hotspot because mm -hmm. it's not really about the hotspot, it's about the service. The right. service has to contract with all the different carriers and yeah. say, hey, we're going to, essentially, we're buying up your excess capacity and we're going to serve it out to our customers. Oh, God, because uh, you remember when we went to IFA last year. That was my <laughs> first experience going to another country and having to use my phone yep. on different networks. Mm -hmm. And so through Verizon, I would get, it was something terrible. It was terrible. crazy expensive. It was like 200 megabytes. And Early. if I went over that, it started charging me. Didn't you have to pay like 100 bucks for the 200 megabytes? It was, yeah. It was something not It was good. something ridiculous. And then every time you get to a new country into a new service, which in Europe, you know, you go from, I think it was in Germany, and then I went to the Netherlands, and then I went back to Luxembourg, yep. and each country has its own, like, network, and so I was, like, resetting my, my megabytes and getting charged. Uh, it, was, it was bad. Yeah, it's always, it's always a bad scene. One thing I will tell you, if you're going to do this, remember, if you're using a Windows 10 machine, you have to go into the settings and tell it that this is a metered connection. Otherwise your Windows 10 machine will try to pull its updates down oh. over your your uh, your local me. Don't. Oh, bad. And then the, you're like, Don't oh, I'm all out of credit. Oh, how did that happen? But I guess if you did need to add uh, more euros to your yeah. plan, it's pretty simple. Super easy. So if you, I mean, again, this is not the best uh, uh, thing, but like if I wanted, where's the recharge? So if I wanted to recharge, it goes here, and then <laughs> I've got different ways to choose how much I want to add. Very cool. Yeah. 58 countries. That, that, I did not do that one. No. It's <laughs> a little pricey. That was, no. But it's no cool thanks. it has that option. Yeah. And, and, you know, I still will buy SIMs. If I'm, like, when I go to Rome, I buy a SIM. Which, by the way, do not buy the SIM at, in the airport. Don't do it at the airport. Because they, they taught me that. overcharge yeah. you. It is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, but, like, Germany. Germany is the best one. You, you can literally walk off the plane, and within 40 steps, you'll be at a kiosk mm -hmm. where you can buy a SIM for 20 bucks. And it gives you like two gigabytes of data. Yeah, which uh, is so much better than what Verizon was doing oh, yeah. for me. Yeah. Uh, but the issue with that is it's going to work in Germany. Yes. So if, if you're like me and you have to hop, that yeah. ends up costing more right. than doing this. And it also means that this is al already in my pocket. When mm -hmm. I'm boarding the plane, I know I'm going to be able to connect when I touch down. That's kind of a good feeling. Okay, so what's battery life like? Did you ever have to charge uh, it or yeah, ever so, have connection issues? Uh, on the internal battery, I was able to get, they say up to 16 hours. I did not get 16 hours. Mm. I got maybe 12. Okay. 12 hours. And uh, I think that was in an area with good connectivity. I'm sure it will drop sharply if Otherwise. you're in an area where it has to transmit at high power. Right. Uh, but, I mean, I have USB batteries, so I just. So not too bad. Yeah. It's not a problem. Okay. I mean, you ever have any issues connecting to networks or? Uh, well, yeah, because it's still wireless. So yeah. if you're in an area that's not getting wireless connectivity, <laughs> no hotspots ever going to work. Not going to make a difference. Yeah. Uh, but where I was, mm -hmm. uh, it did really well. In fact, there was never a time when I was in Malta or Rome where it did not have connectivity. Cool. There was one time when I was in Amsterdam when it started to kind of fritz out. Yeah. Okay, that's to be expected, I guess. Go figure. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and move on. We're going from local me to local my Pi. Ah, I couldn't make that transition. Hmm. Yeah. What do we got? Right. So this question comes from Robert. I'm going to say Robert because like he doesn't that. have a T that's on it. That's fancy. And he asks, what kind slash brand of MSATA card would work best for a Raspberry Pi and keep the build in the extra Linux computer for my bench price range? Okay, hmm. go ahead and click that, uh, Alex. I saw this at Maker Faire. Uh, the, the other month. And essentially all it is is it's an enclosure that you put a Raspberry into and then it gives mm. you the ability to add an MSATA drive. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah. it's like it has an expansion slot in it there? It has an expansion slot. So you could do something like, uh, Alex, go to that link I've got, the Samsung 850 Evo. This is, this is a nice fast device. It's not that expensive. 256 gigabytes for about a hundred bucks. Uh, <laughs> that's the three times the price of the Raspberry Pi. The three times the price of the Raspberry <laughs> Pi. Here's the issue though. Uh, that enclosure does have an MSATA interface, yeah. but all it is is a USB interface back to the <laughs> Pi, and it's USB 2, so it is grossly faster than anything the Raspberry Pi would ever be able to transfer. <laughs> that seems so silly. It is a little silly. I guess, is that trying to future? If they're no, I mean, because it's, it's a USB 2 interface. It's, oh. no. It's not going to no. happen. It's not no. going to happen. Bad. Uh, I mean, what I would do is don't go with the MSATA, because the MSATA, you're paying extra for the size. Yeah. Go with a full-size 2.5-inch SSD, because for the same price as a 256-gigabyte SSD, you can get a 512-gigabyte, like a Kingston yeah. Economy uh, unit. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be way faster than anything that uh, the Raspberry Pi can ever transfer over its USB 2.0 interface, yeah. but you 
we'll have it cheaper and bigger and it actually includes the uh, the enclosure. So that right. if you buy the Kingston kit, you the, get the, the enclosure. Yeah. The enclosure, yeah. So that's okay. what yeah, that little case looks nice though. If you want nice to case. turn your Pi into a, a full fledged desktop. Well, I mean, they were really pushing it at Maker Fair, and I was like, yeah, it looks nice, but it's not anything we haven't seen before. <laughs> How much was the case? I didn't see. Uh, what sixty bucks? Sixty bucks. Like yeah, it's it's cute. It's cute. It's, it's cute. Uh, okay. All right. All right. All right. Yeah, that's, that's not bad. Not bad at all. All right, let's do one more before we close it out. We got someone who has a question about surveillance. All right, this one comes from Francis, and he asks, To all the users of Synology Surveillance Station, just wondering if you, any of you guys bought an additional device licenses. I have a DS216 Play and already am using two cameras, but I'm tempted to add maybe one or two. Curious if I'm the only Kita that's considering it. You yeah. are not... Uh, no. All Synology NASes can do up to 10 devices, 10, okay. 10 network devices. You have to pay for the licenses. You get the first two for free, mm. and then they can run about $50 per or down. I bought a 10-pack for something like uh, $375. And those are lifetime? Then? Those are you don't lifetime. You have to like, renew right. the license. But license. But it's, okay. you, know, you get a number for each one, and every ah. number you type in, that activates another slot. I see. The thing is, though, he's using the 216 Play, which is it's a lower power unit. Mm -hmm. I could probably get away with using four cameras on a 216 Play. I probably would not go above that because you'll start dropping frames. I see. It's too much stress this for it. This is too much stress for it. It's, that's a lot of processing power. And that's a lot of transfer. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, four devices, no problem. Okay. Absolutely. Cool. Um, and, uh, yes, it is a fantastic solution. You should consider it. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we answered that then. Yeah, how about that? Cool. Well, Brian, this has been a fun episode. We've yeah. had a little bit of a, a review. We've, uh, we've had fun building something for someone who might need it. Right, right. And, uh, you know, we've had a chance to take a look at things like the Glocal Me. Yeah, I, kinda, I like these feedback episodes because not only does it give us a chance to interact with people, you know, who are, are we're doing this show for, but it gives us a variety of things to talk about. About, like we got to build something today, we got to review something today, and then we uh, answered a couple questions. I yeah. got to show off a NAS that no way in the world I'm going to let Brian play with. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Now, folks, if you want to find out more about anything that we've covered, the notes, the links for the episode, you got to go to our show page, which, Brian, where do they find that? You can find that over at twit.tv slash kh, and not only will you find the show notes with links to all the stuff that we talked about today, like if you want to buy that NAS for me, <coughs> or, I mean, if you want to download or subscribe to the, uh, the show, you can do that there. Yeah, and also don't forget that you can find us on the social, specifically on Google+. Just go to Google+, and find Know How. Ask to join, because we have to keep out the spam accounts, and we still get people who do spam, which is amazing, Hmm. Because their spam gets caught up in the filter and then I ban them. So it must be an automated process. Yeah, it has But to if be. you're not a spammer and you're not a bot, go ahead and jump in. You get access to over 11,000 Kitas. Those are our know it alls. People who maybe have potential projects for you, maybe people who need your help. Maybe you just like seeing what other people build. Give us pictures and videos of your builds and your questions, and maybe you'll end up on an episode of Know How. That's right, but if you want to see what we're doing outside of Know How or what kind of projects we might have coming up, the best place to do that is on Twitter, and I am at Cranky underscore Hippo. And you can find me at Padre SJ. And we've got a third member of our crew. Do we? Yes, we do. He's a, he's a good man. <laughs> we do. Uh, yeah, uh, Andrew. You can find Andrew here every episode. <laughs> he lives in the abyss. He lives in the darkness that is that corner. And Andrew, you can find him at twitter.com <laughs> slash A-N-E-L-F-3. Are you Excuse me, Andrew Padre. Nelf. Uh, Excuse yeah. me, Padre. It's pronounced Alex. Mm, that's not uh, no, that's huh. that's not in the Ziploc or the cupboard of knowledge. <laughs> I think you've got a hole in your I Ziploc think. bag. <laughs> <laughs> Things are falling out. Anyways, folks, until next time, I am Father Robert Ballasier, and I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, keep asking us questions because we might answer them if we know the answers. If we don't know the answer, we're not going to answer it. No, we'll still answer it. <laughs> yeah, we probably would. <laughs>